Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, April of 1962, there are ads running in newspapers in Louisiana which read, Free transportation plus $5 for expenses to any Negro man or woman or family, no limit in size, who desire to migrate to the nation's capital or any city in the north of their choosing. This ad may seem somewhat innocuous, if a little confusing, free transportation for black men and women from the south to a city in the north, But these ads were taken out by the Greater New Orleans Citizens Council, which is a white group that opposed civil rights efforts. And this plan was essentially in retaliation for the Freedom Rides. We've talked about the Freedom Rides before on the show, but that is when mostly young white liberals from the north would come to the south to help with voter registration and other civil rights efforts. And here were racist white groups in the South ginning up this idea for what became known as the reverse freedom rides. And I guess the logic was like, let's send black people from the South to the North and then see how those liberal Northerners feel about it. So let's talk about the reverse freedom rides and what was really going on here. Uh, And here, as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wesley. Hello there. Hi, Jody. Hey there. Um, so we'll get into the specific effort here, but I, you know, I name checked the citizens council in this case, it was the greater new Orleans citizens councils, but you read about citizens councils all the time. You hear about citizens councils. Sometimes they're referred to as white citizens councils, but this is our chance, I guess, to lay the context of what this organizing group is. Um, not just in new Orleans, but I guess they were in most, in in a lot of Southern cities in this, in this Mm -hmm. time period. Yeah, the Citizens Council is just sort of like a dressed up way of saying the Klan with suits. <laughs> like that's it is an, mm-hmm. a sort of an innocuous way of not necessarily directly signposting to these white nationalist groups. Uh, but that's what they were. They were Klansmen, white nationalists, white supremacists that wanted to um, create the same amount of harm that a, a Klansman would right. do, except there was like a sort of tone of civility about it sort of like a tone Mm -hmm. of we wear suits we have jobs we have you know titles we're not like bubba from the outback or whatever like um and i think that there's a level of i hate to say it but like respectability about being a part of a citizens council than there was about being a member of the clan that's exactly right. This is respectability politics for white racists. Yeah. Um, the original name of the Citizens Council was the White Citizens Council, and they largely dropped that first word in order to sort of dress up their group a little bit. But Kelly's exactly right. First of all, in the class difference mm-hmm. here, um, that by the 1950s in particular, people who were members of the Klan tended to be um, of a lower class than in the early days of the Klan. Um, so this was kind of your mid middle to upper class or businessmen, people like that who would be part of the Citizens Council. And though they absolutely were not (laughs) violence free, um, they were also more likely to try to use things like passing laws, like media stunts like this, um, taking pictures of people who tried to register to vote and getting them fired from their jobs, to use those kinds of methods in order to stymie civil rights activism um, without necessarily being stained with the kind of of, um, uh, reputation of the Klan. And, you, you know, you read about these groups, and certainly there were a lot of very powerful business and political leaders who were members of the Citizens Council as well, and so that probably made it a little easier for them to say, I'm a member of this group rather than I'm a member of the KKK. But also, just in general, like, mm-hmm. it, yeah, you, if, you're a, if you're a mayor or a city council mm-hmm. member, are you going to take a meeting with a KKK, a yeah, Grand, Grand Wizard, Wizard or you yeah. take a meeting with um, with the president of the Citizens Council, <laughs> or if you're in a newspaper and you're referring to who's the organization here, it just yeah, and so it just it um it cloaks what's mm-hmm. really going on, but it also gives others sort of an excuse or an out to um, treat you respectably mm-hmm. um, as well, which I think plays into this story as well because this you know mm-hmm. cockamamie scheme yeah. to send uh, people to the north starts out as an actual lobbying effort of of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. There's an attempt to to secure money from the Louisiana legislature to, what, put people on buses and send them to the north? I mean, what's what's the idea here? They attempted to secure about $100,000 from the Louisiana legislature 
to pay for not just the transportation to go to these northern cities, but also the five dollar incentive that might cover food or any other expenses. But this is, you know, this is an expensive endeavor. It reminds me a lot of in the 19th century where you had like the American Colonization Society. And part of the reason why it Mm. wasn't that successful was because it was expensive shipping people back to Africa. And so in this same, you know, similar operation, people are trying to ship people to the north as a way of saying like, take that. How do you like that? And it's ridiculous. It's uh, and aside from being ridiculous is also expensive and the fact that you know they have to do fundraising in order to make this scheme work is just wild to me yeah the legislature to be clear doesn't give them the money i suppose yeah you know good on I, them I don't, know I, much, I don't know how many <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know how many like notches in the belt of the louisiana state legislature in 1962 mm. there are, but I guess good job not giving them funding for this but but yeah, what are, what are the plans or what else do, you, do we need to know about this, Nick? So I, I think something that's important to know is that it, it was a plan with a twofold purpose. One was to create this phenomenon of, oh, all these black Southerners are flooding these northern cities um, to elicit white racism in the north and to kind of get white northerners to leave them alone. But it was also to... Um, they wanted to demonstrate to um, black Southerners that actually... The North isn't any better than the South. You're going to face racism there. You're going to be tossed out on the street. Nobody's going to help you. You're going to be abandoned. There are no jobs there. And you should be satisfied with the situation that you have here in the South and stop agitating for change. Mm. And so it's kind of that twofold message that they're trying to deliver. They call the media ahead of time so that there will be reporters yeah. there to cover it when they arrive like it's a it's a whole thing but it's also yeah. not just about recruiting black people to come to the north it's also about recruiting a specific kind so they want criminals they want single mothers they want people with poor reputations so that it can uh, appear as though what they are doing is, you know, sending all of the worst possible black people uh, to the North. These are not people you want to give charity to. These are not people you want to house in your home or have enough space to house in your home if it's someone with six kids or seven kids or someone with a criminal background. Um, And so they're trying to even cripple the charity that white Northerners might give out if there was charity to be given Mm -hmm. out i think we're doing more thinking than they may have ever done (laughs) about this i mean you know it's it's like at some level it really just feels like a a troll it um, is a prank and just like a you know a, a prank almost with obviously with people's lives but you know because it's just like you scratch at the logic for half a second and it just doesn't make sense but it's basically just like anger like oh you white northern kids are coming down here well let well Oh, so you, I mean, what is the logic? The logic is like, oh, you say you love black people? Well, here's some black people. Like, is that really just kind of like the extent of the logic? I mean, it's just so awful. Which also doesn't make sense because like the Great Migration is almost at its peak Mm -hmm. at this point. So black people are in the North. You know what I mean? Like they're in Chicago, they're in Detroit, they're in Cleveland, they're in all of these spaces. It's not like we haven't had this Great Migration yet. And if they were honest about the Great Migration, the South was being hurt by that. They were losing laborers. They were losing, you know, skilled and non-skilled workers to do a lot of these jobs. And so most white Southerners actually wouldn't be on board with losing their low-wage labor source. And this is absolutely one of those instances where it's the cruelty is the point. Like they promised jobs, they promised yeah, yeah. housing. Um, so they had they had given these people a promise of something good and golden waiting on the other side. And you know, the thing is, like these the folks who arrive, the migrants who arrive, aren't immediately thrown out in the streets. Um, there are civil rights activists and some city leaders who reach out to them and try to help them find jobs and find housing um, because they understand that this is a, a cruel stunt that they have been exposed to and want to do something to help them out. You're used to 
to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. I always go back to Nikki has this great tweet. You said it a couple years ago. I don't know where you're like the emotion most associated with racism is not hatred. It's pleasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like there is a real pleasure in like being able to have cameras there to capture either the shock or the disappointment or the racism, you know, that these uh, black people would experience. And it's almost like, hey, you're caught on candid camera. You know, like, what are you going to do? And it's just awful, especially for people who have traveled with children mm -hmm. um, and are expecting resources to be there for them, and they don't have any support system to fall back right. on. So, uh, you know, a few hundred African Americans um, participated, and there were a series of these re reverse freedom rides. Um, yeah, they were they were made promises about what would be there in the north, economic opportunity, you know, mostly New York, Chicago, Philly, Los Angeles were the biggest destinations, though the biggest contingent of rivals of of riders went from Little Rock, Arkansas to Hyannis, which is the home of JFK's vacation home. And I think that is a very clear kind of like mm. concerted stunt there to drop off folks on JFK's uh, doorstep in his Tony neighborhood. Um, and I think that that fell flat largely. And I mm -hmm. think people started to really, you know, certainly in the North people, I mean, JFK himself referred to it as a cheap exercise, a rather cheap exercise, which I guess from a Kennedy is like the biggest burn possible to call something cheap uh, or rather cheap. Rather um, cheap. You know, yeah, exactly. But the New York Times called it, you know, a, tre a cheap trafficking and human misery on the part of Southern racists. I mean, it was just, you know, kind of clearly... Uh, exposed for what it was and then Gallup polls showed that generally you know widespread disapproval throughout the country for these tactics including from white mm -hmm. southerners um, this yeah. was seen as something that was not a big shining badge of honor for for the south um, for these actions and to give, you know, uh, an example, there's a woman by the name of Leela Mae Williams who is from Arkansas and she gets dropped off with her nine children. Um, and, you know, she's dressed in her finest clothes. She's told not to pack a whole lot that, oh, don't worry, there'll be provisions for you. Everything will be taken care of for you. And she believed that. Wasn't well, she told the Kennedys if, were going to greet her? Oh, directly? yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The president, the president will be there to greet you. And, you know, she gets there and realizes, you know, basically there's pie on her face. There's there's nothing that uh, none of these promises were, were coming for her. And on top of that, she no longer has family close by who can support sure. her. And, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of her story is kind of sad. Her family, you know, stays in, in Boston or in the Boston area and they, you know, live in housing projects and they have a pretty tough time of it. Yeah. Her family and her story is the subject of that Code Switch mm -hmm, episode, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so people should go check that out. We'll put a maybe put a link in that. Um, um, so look, we haven't drawn the connection, but I think people have clearly, you know, have probably drawn the connection to some of very similar kinds of stunts in the last years around migrants who came to Florida and Texas, and the governors of Florida and Texas putting people on buses and shipping them to D.C. and New York. Um, and I've done a lot of work here in New York with folks who were put on buses and landed here and um, in, and also uh, Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. right? Was mm -hmm. that? And so, mm -hmm. you know, and all of these same things clearly were part of it. You know, the sort of stunt, the pleasure in mm -hmm. the thumbing of your nose, not the yeah. anger, but the pleasure that's really right. Um, but, you know, it's just... <laughs> you know, same playbook. And that is interesting too because it's not being, uh, uh, these are not coming from fundraisers mm -hmm. that are, they are using tax right. dollars to send these people to northern states and cities. And that to me is even more incredulous using taxpayer dollars to, to do this stunt. When you're operating beneath 1960s Louisiana no. state politics, no. you're, not, you're not putting forward your best. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, it takes a lot for something to pop through as particularly cruel um, for me these mm -hmm. days, and those mm -hmm. those did. I mean, it was just kind of 
really despicable, um, despicable yeah. behavior. Yeah. Well, especially when you realize what the Freedom Riders right. were trying to accomplish, you know, when they were trying to open up the interstate highway mm-hmm. and open up, you know, transportation and really forge rights for people who already should have had these rights. Um, it just it falls so flat. And I mean... You know, this did not pull well with white Southerners in the 1960s, but for supporters of the politicians who engaged in these stunts in 2022 and 2023, it hasn't cost them support. It's elevated their national reputations. Um, and that's mm. a difference worth flagging as well. Yeah. Mm. Huh. Well, I'll be interested to see, I mean, how salient that issue is or so forth. I don't know. I felt like that was a place. Maybe that's just me, but I just felt like, even from a you know just purely political standpoint, I felt like maybe DeSantis and Abbott felt like they took a step too far there and pulled back. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, they're not. They're certainly not apologizing. But no. I think people read it as just purely c- cruel, um, mm-hmm. in a wider sense yeah. than maybe some of the other stuff, which feels more like it's being debated or whatever. Um, but right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a lot of both sidesing of this particular yeah, issue. Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I guess the real issue is yeah. that you know. Even something that's very clearly cruel doesn't necessarily come with a political price at this point. Um, Mm -hmm. So even if people Mm -hmm. recognize it for what Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. All right. Well, we will leave it there. And um, I'm sure we'll come back to this time period and this part of the world again. But for now, we'll leave it there with Nicole Hemmer. Thanks to you as always. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson. Thanks to you. My pleasure. Radio Topia. From P.